Yeah, hi. So um, last time at .go, I gave a, a lightning talk about the semantics of errors. So since then, I sort of rolled into doing more error stuff, and I, together with a lot of other team, uh, people on the Go team, have looked more into possible language and library changes related to errors. So today, I want to talk to you about uh, some of the library changes, and specifically the error values proposal that we would like to get into Go 1.13. But before I get into the details of that, I would like to give you some of the reasoning and, and thinking behind that. So firstly, we identified three typical users of error values. Like two of these are human, I'll leave it up to you to decide which. Uh, but let's go into the details for each of them a little bit more. So end users, when they see an error message, they want it to be informative and succinct. Uh, and also possibly localized, like a develop, uh, an end user might not um, speak the same language as a developer. Uh, so it would be good if these messages can be translated. So today it's a little bit difficult. So a developer, on the other hand, might want to have more detail about an error. So if you see an error, you might want to know what's going on. You want to be able to debug it. So for example, related to a position in the code. Um, so programs, they care more about um, determining what control flow they should take, right? Like so making control flow decisions based on the error value. And uh, we've identified three major ways in which people do this. So one is to compare it against the Sentinel value. So that's by far the most common one. So another one is to basically um, cast your error value to a specific error type, and then look at, for example, specific fields of this type or methods to determine uh, certain values. Um, and then everybody's favorite, of course, is uh, checking for a substring in an error message. So the fact that this last one is, is necessary at all already indicates there's something lacking about dealing with error values in Go. So let's look a little bit more at the core libraries in this respect. So um, a very common way of creating error values is uh, using FMAT ERRORF. So this allows you to annotate some text with an existing error. So the problem with FMAT ERRORF is that it discards information. Um, so basically, uh, you lose the ability to do programmatic analysis in any sane way, except for checking for substrings. Uh, but also, you, you lose the ability to annotate an error with detailed information when printing, because you just don't know the structure of the error anymore. So the way we work around this in the core library is to define custom error types. So a, a very common one and well-known one is path error. So path error um, wraps a bunch of values, but most importantly, it wraps the underlying cause of the error that it wants to preserve. And we can use that, for example, if you get an error back, you can cast it to path error. You can determine if it's a permission error, for example. It's a little bit cumbersome, so in order to make this easier, the core library provides these predicate functions like is permission um, to determine if an error is a permission error. But of course, this breaks down. If you start wrapping a path error with your own custom type, OS, uh, is permission doesn't know anymore how to deal with this. So this is a problem. Um, and if you do that, right, like looking for a substring actually becomes very appealing. So, so there we have it. So the lack of standard for errors really results, to awkward, uh, results in awkward code. So I'm, of course, not the first one to notice this, and many other people have noticed this problem before. So there's actually many uh, solutions in the, uh, you know, in the community provided by the community to solve this problem. So not all error packages address the same issues that we discuss here, but a vast majority address at least some subset of it. So problem solved, right? Well, there is a problem that remains. So even though these packages might work by itself, like the different error values produced by these packages don't interoperate very well. So for example, um, a, a, common, a common pattern is to provide a cost method which returns an error to expose the underlying error. Uh, the problem with this is that the meaning of this method varies slightly by different packages, so it actually becomes very dangerous to use them together. Uh, so another thing is, like, different packages might print the error chain in a different order, like outside in, inside out, and if you combine them, it actually looks like a mess. Um, also, even the, 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 printing, the, um, the, the printing directives actually vary slightly per package, so that's kind of awkward. Uh, so all in all, it's, it's, you know, they, they allude to a lot of good solutions, but it, um, it doesn't work well together in practice. So where do we go from here if we try this? So one thing that has served the Go community very well, we think, is the uh, errors as value mantra. 
So we really think that people should be able to write their own custom error types. And whatever solution we provide, um, it should not be like shoving one way of dealing with errors down everybody's throats, right? It, it should be an open standard. But we do need a standard to improve the interoperability when it comes to inspection, printing details, or even localization. So this is really what the Go113 uh, errors value proposal is about. So let's go to, into more detail. So let's first focus on what programs can do uh, and you know, to, to, to inspect. So the, the most important thing that we're adding here is the ability to, um, to expose the underlying error. So this is very specifically the underlying errors that, uh, that programs should use to anal uh, analyze and make decisions on. Um, so for printing, we have something different, and we come back to that later. Um, so we did deliberately did not use the cost method, uh, because that's already tainted, right? And there's different semantics for it. Uh, so unwrap, we didn't really see much or at all. So this is, uh, hopefully, we can keep a uh, consistent semantics here. So a very uh, you know, obvious use case for this is, for example, path error. So with path error, we can now expose the underlying error by providing this method. And that allows anybody to find this underlying uh, error without actually having to know what a path error is. So uh, typ typically, users will not um, unwrap these errors themselves, right? Or, or call the unwrap method directly. You would use a helper function for this. So the helper function that we uh, intend to provide is errors is. So errors is allows you to compare an error value against the sentinel value. So it's a replacement for the error check. But the biggest difference here is that except for, you know, instead of it comparing it to one error, you compare it to all errors in the error chain. Uh, but it does something else. So it al also allows you uh, to, to implement an is method on an error so that an error can post itself as a sentinel, even though it's not itself a sentinel value. So for example, if you have an error type that adds all, all kinds of information, um, you can make it a permission error by uh, providing an is method that says, you know, checks for a permission sentinel, and then says, yes, I'm a permission error. So basically, we did not provide a cause function. This is the most common uh, pattern we see in the community. Uh, but the cost, uh, uh, the cost API does not let us do the is method pattern, uh, and it also doesn't allow us to check multiple errors in the error chain. So why is this important? So let's look a little bit better at errors uh, is permission. So before we had this uh, predicate, so now we can just replace this with an errors is call. So because we have this is method, we can basically um, you know, implement it so that even dynamic errors can be a permissions error. So we don't need the permissions predicate anymore. But it gets a little bit more tricky. If you look at uh, net op error, um, so basically to determine whether that's a timeout error or not, you have to look at the op error itself as well as the error it wraps. So it gets very complicated. There's a lot of logic in it. And the way to do it now is you take an error that you get from the net package, you cast it to a net error, and that provides a method that will determine whether it's a timeout or not. So again, here, the user will have to know the specific pattern and specifically you know, like how to cast and to which error to cast, what to expect. And of course, if you would wrap this with your custom type, it breaks down again as well. But with errors this, we can replace that pattern in its entirety. Uh, thanks to the is method and checking the entire error chain. So you also see a pattern emerging here that whereas before you had to cast to a specific error type, we don't really need to do that anymore. And we didn't expect this, but once we are, uh, look more into changing the core libraries, it turns out a lot of these, the need for this goes away. So we think that actually by far the most common use is errors is. And we do provide also a way to cast to a specific error type using the same um, unwrap methods and, and walking the error chain, but I will not give that much attention because we also think it will be rare. So the other part of the proposal is printing. So printing is about providing detail and, and allowing localization. So let's look at detail first. So at the top, you have an error message, uh, which looks very much like the error message and actually is the type of error message you would expect from Go. Um, but below, you have that same message, but now with detail information added. 
So if you look carefully, uh, you can judge that from the colon, uh, from the above message. There's really two mes uh, errors involved here, one wrapping the other. And in the detailed output, each of these gets its own line. And below that, you can have detailed information. So in this case, we have uh, like stack information, but it can be any, anything you want to print there. So how would you do that? So there is this formatter interface. You can implement format error. Uh, and this is uh, unfortunately in addition to error because it still needs to be an error to be an error. Uh, but you can you can uh, view format error as basically a detailed way of of printing errors. So it's very much like having Fumet printer and stringer. It's about for those of you who know what that means. It's about the same relation. So there's also a printer interface. Users typically won't have to to think about it. Uh, right now there's only one implementation. That's the one in the Fumet package. Uh, but it's the printer that determines how things are printed. So this ensures uh, consistent printing. It also allows localization frameworks to provide their own implementation to do the automatic translation. So another building block that we're providing is a frame, which allows you to record a single frame in your custom error type. So we, we think that having a single frame uh, will typically be enough. In most cases, that's enough. And it's also a good compromise performance-wise. Including an entire stack can be quite expensive. And, and the single frame case, we can optimize uh, quite a bit, potentially. So um, it will cover more cases. It becomes very important, though, that we really have a standard, because now it becomes more important that every error in the chain annotates itself with a location. So how do you put this all together? Well, let's look at path error again. So here you see an example of a format error implemented for path error. So one big distinction with error, the error method, is that you now only print the information pertaining to the error itself and not to anything it wraps. So instead, you just return what you wrap, and then the printer takes care of the rest. Um, here we see it prints the detail uh, for, the, for the frame, uh, and the frame format method itself takes care of checking the detailed method and will only print when there is detail. But you can do that yourself as well. So uh, this is all nice, but how do we migrate from the old situation to the other one? There's, there's quite a bit of differences, um, but largely the old code will keep working, right, in the new scenario. Um, of course, um, if you start wrapping, right, like then a, an old traditional sentinel check will break down. So old APIs will be a little bit restricted into moving to the new pattern, but we hope that's still, you know, to make it as easy as possible. So let's look at the core error types first. So the first thing we have to do is to change many of the core error types uh, to add unwrap uh, whenever they already expose the underlying error anyway, like path error. Um, and also make errors is work with uh, many of the sentinels we have in core. So we might want to add more sentinel values. So for example, for timeout and temporary to, to have a consistent pattern. Um, but that's not, uh, you know, that, that's, that's fairly straightforward. Um, so the main thing to note here that in changing the core library so far, we've seen that it really cleans up the code as well. Like before, there were all these things where we check for substrings and error messages and all this stuff. All this is now going away. So this is quite nice. So to make the transition smooth, um, we also want to add a single stack frame to existing calls, so errors new and error f. So this will incur a little bit of overhead, so we hope it will work out with performance. Uh, I optimized from it, uh, RF quite a bit, so to, to give back some of the, the, the lost time there, um, when we think it will work. So also to make this work, it doesn't really make much sense um, to try to do this if we also don't um, you know, recognize the type of error that, that Fumit RF is wrapping. Uh, so luckily, almost everybody using uh, Fumit RF, if they wrap an error, they, their format string will end with percent uh, with colon percent V or colon percent S. So what we're doing right now is, uh, it's a little bit hacky, right? But we're recognizing this pattern and then automatically transforming that message uh, into a properly implemented format error. Um, so this will give a huge bang for the buck, right? This will immediately c uh, convert like a very large percentage of the, uh, of the errors to using the new format. So what we're not doing though is automatically also providing an unwrap method. Uh, so this is only for formatting. So automatically providing an unwrap method would automatically expose the wrapped error to the API, whereas before it was not. Uh, and that's not necessarily a breaking change, because you have to use errors to detect that. Um, 
but it is dangerous, so we don't want to go there. This is really up to the library writer to, to do this. And the current method to, to make that easy to do is to introduce a new verb, the W, that will indicate that you're also wrapping the error. So we've considered many options here. We consider this to be the least of all evils. If we started from scratch, we do it differently. Um, but there might be an even lesser evil that uh, we'll change it into before Go113. So what can you do? So, um, of course, not everybody has the luxury to work from head or even um, you know, use 113 as soon as it comes out. Uh, but we want you to give the, what we really want is to get feedback on this mechanism, right, as soon as possible and already allow people to convert and make packages that will work both with 113 and with the old code. So this is where XERRORS comes in. So XERRORS implements most of the functionality that's in core. Um, clearly doesn't add the core sentinels, but uh, errors is, errors s, uh, and all these things are provided. And so if you want to implement your own format error method, you can do that, and all you need to do is also implement format, and then use one of the, uh, the, the adapter provided in xerrors to reroute the format to format error. So this way, like your, your uh, error type will work with uh, all the current libraries, all the current printing, and as soon as 113 is being used, it will switch it over, right? So, so you can see here that there is an X errors printer being used. So right now there's a build tag that as soon as you start using 113, that becomes an alias to uh, errors printer, and everything will work. So what do, you want, what do we want to know from you? So we're trying to get these things in as early as a cycle as possible, whenever there's a uh, you know, like, like fundamental change, so to give people as long as possible to, to try this out. Um, we've already incorporated a lot of the community feedback since we released the design drafts at GopherCon, uh, but nothing beats real-life experience, right? So now it's in core, you can, uh, in head, you can actually try it, and we would love to hear this feedback. And... Um, so having said that, I'm looking forward to receiving your feedback, and thank you for listening. <laughs>